If we look at the challenges around climate change, around 55% of CO2 emissions can be solved by switching completely to renewables. But the 45% that remain cannot be solved in that way. If we look at circular principles and apply those three principles to materials such as steel, cement, plastic, food, and aluminium, we find that of that 45% that remains, around half can be saved. That's the equivalent of taking all global transport off the road and out of the air. So circular economy plays a really key role in solving many of the problems around climate change. That was Ellen MacArthur explaining why a circular economy that eliminates waste, keeps products in use and regenerates nature has a key role to play in tackling climate change. This means that by applying the circular economy and redesigning their products, business models and systems, companies can take significant steps towards their climate positive ambition. In this video, we will hear from representatives from two such companies. We will be joined by Laura Vicaria from Mad Jeans, a circular denim brand, who will be talking to us about their circular uh, leasing business model and how it is disrupting the fashion industry. But first, let's hear about how there is much more to eliminating carbon emissions in the car manufacturing industry than just a switch to electric vehicles. We are joined by James Lundstrom from Volvo Cars, who will be talking to us about how they are approaching the topic in his company. So the long-term setup is that we have said that we will be carbon neutral by 2040. And that, in order to realize that, that also means that we need to be a circular business or a circular company by 2040. Because as was mentioned here earlier, even for a, an energy intense product like a vehicle during its use phase, still roughly 40 to 45 percent of the total carbon impact comes from design and operations around the vehicle, both in production, service and, and end of life. Now, to reach that target, we've then broken it down and started with a, a sort of a, a set of circular targets and carbon impact targets towards 2025 as well. Here, of course, we are the, the final customer in the long supply chain. A general component normally has four to five levels of suppliers involved. Um, but also, a lot of our suppliers are huge companies as well who have the same commitment to creating a more sustainable business. So there is a joint interest here. It's not just that we have to, if I say, chase our suppliers. We have a tremendous amount of input of suppliers who are bringing new ideas, new material concepts, new concepts instead of selling parts. And, and they're looking for partners to help them achieve their own sustainability goals. So we can work a lot with the, the major suppliers to show that the smaller ones that may not have the same R&D and innovation cap capability, that this can be done and it can be done in a profitable way. And once that is visual to them, it is a lot easier to get them to follow along. And I would say that what we've seen so far is that we are we're well on track with our progress and we are definitely being able to are able to show that we can do this in a very profitable way and we can have our suppliers coming along on that journey being coming a circular business means that we're looking at a future where we have to differentiate the, the ownership models of a vehicle. And so we already today have three options essentially to consumers, a little bit depending on where in the world you are, where you can buy the car, you can subscribe to a car, like you essentially subscribe to a cell phone. And when you don't want a car, you hand it back and we can take care of it and make it ready for the next customer. And we've also started with uh, having transport as a service, which is a company we call M. Uh, which we're rolling out now since about two years, where you only pay as you go for the amount of time where you use the car, and otherwise it's just in the app and parked at a close by space where you want it. So, even in the mobility industry, roughly 40 to 45% of the carbon emission impacts come in the design phase. It might start by working out how you can recycle a bit more of your material and with how you engage with your suppliers, but ultimately, you have to analyze the design of your whole business, as James said. Next up, we're going to hear from Laura Vicaria, the CSR manager at Mad Jeans. You might be asking yourself, what impact can a denim company have on carbon emissions? Well, Laura explains exactly that and what Mad Jeans are doing to become a fully circular business. 
that the fashion industry is one of the most polluting industries in the world. It's also accountable for 4% of the world's waste production. So at Mud Jeans, we use circularity not only to lower our environmental impact, but also our creation of waste. So through our circular business, particularly taking back our jeans and using that material to make new products, we are able to take responsibility over the end of life of our product and we prevent it ending up ending up in a landfill or incinerated, causing further environmental impact. But also we are increasing the amount of recycled content that we're using, which lowers the amount of new virgin material that we're taking in. And that, as a consequence, actually has a really positive environmental uh, effect in that we're not causing so much environmental impact. In fact, we conducted an LCA in 2019, and we knew and we know that by using not only uh, organic cotton, but up to 40% post-consumer recycled cotton in our jeans, our jeans um, have a 70% lower CO2 impact than industry standard and a 92% lower water consumption than industry, spent, industry standard. And those are significant values. And as we keep on growing and, and keep on becoming more and more circular, we hope to make those numbers even bigger. Mud jeans, the main difference is that we're a circular denim company. And what that means is that we incorporate circularity across our business. Simply put, we actually take our old jeans, recycle them, and reincorporate them back into production. Um, we have a very short supply chain. Primarily, it's for our main supply chain partners. We start in Recover, where our jeans are uh, recycled and turned into fiber, um, blended in with GOTS certified organic cotton, turned into a yarn. Then we move to Tejidos Rojo, where the yarn is dyed and turned into a fabric. And then we move to Ustex International, and they turn that fabric, they cut it, stitch it, and wash it into a brand new pair of, of denim jeans. This is very unique for the denim industry because, A, it's very short. So uh, three of those supply chain partners are in Spain, and the third one, uh, the fourth one, excuse me, is in um, Tunisia. And so we keep everything quite close, and that helps us actually have a very low environmental impact as well. More importantly, we also have a very close relationship with them. Uh, you cannot have a circular business without a close relationship with your supply chain partners. So the concept of leasing is uh, something that well, is what Mudgeons is actually famous for. And the idea behind it is to challenge the idea of ownership and give our customers the opportunity to still own something new, but not having the environmental anxiety of owning a new product. The way it works is that our customers can lease a pair of jeans for 12 months. Uh, the first lease will cost you $9.95 per month. Um, and at the end of those 12 months, those jeans are, of course, yours. But the idea is that we ask our customers to send back the jeans um, so that we can recycle it or make it part of our vintage collection. We want to take a big leap towards being even more circular, and that is achieving a pair of jeans that is 100% made from post-consumer recycled cotton. So we call this objective the Road to 100, and we're working with uh, Saxion University. And the objective is to combine two types of recycling. It's, it's a combination of chemical recycling with mechanical recycling. And by the end of 2021, we hope to have the first sample and hopefully... If all goes well, then the years to follow, we will be able to provide our customers with a pair of jeans that is 100% made from post-consumer recycled cotton, which means lower environmental impact and lower biodiversity impact. So, radical reduction of the need for virgin material through better design and new business models and a shorter supply chain. Even across these two quite different sectors, we can see an obvious pattern. These are two examples of businesses connecting the dots between the circular economy and their climate-related objectives. But how does that play into the bigger picture? We were able to catch up with Chad Frisman from Project Drawdown. This is a project that regularly updates a list of the most impactful solutions to climate change. We asked him to explain the notion of drawdown as an idea, but also how do we get there? 
Finally, we also asked him to describe what some of the most impactful solutions might be. So what drawdown is, is that point in time when those atmospheric concentrations of greenhouse gases begins to decline on a year-to-year basis. It's essentially when we're taking out more of those heat-trapping gases than we're putting in to Earth's atmosphere. And the proposition is, is really pretty simple. When we can change the concentrations of those gases like carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, and, and fluorinated gases, we can essentially stop global warming and begin the long process of reversing it. And this is an actual prerequisite to solving the climate emergency that we're facing today uh, and in future generations to come. So it's an absolute, an absolutely uh, an essential uh, um, a, a goal that, uh, that we have to attain in order to, to achieve our, our broader climate targets. But the great thing about it is when we achieve drawdown through a system of solutions, we not only can solve our climate targets, but have a cascading series of benefits to human and planetary well-being that go well beyond our climate targets. So, first things first, we have to understand where are the sources of those emissions coming from to start with? Because if we can know where the sources are, then we can find the solutions to uh, the, the, the sources of the problem itself. Well, once we uh, once greenhouse gases are already in the atmosphere, we need to identify what are the natural sinks, the mechanisms that we have available to us to pull carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and store it. We luckily have uh, natural carbon sinks that happen. So how do we enhance those sinks? And then really, how do we fundamentally change society itself, so that when we are implementing these solutions, we do so from a, a human rights-based approach with justice, equity, and inclusion at the core of everything we do when we implement that system of solutions. And when we think about you know, uh, our energy systems, we think about uh, the electricity that's generated from coal, oil, and gas when we turn on our lights, or uh, you know, the gas that's burned in our furnaces to heat our homes. The, 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 the petrol burned in our internal combustion engine, and think it, we're combusting things in engines uh, to move us from point A to point B. And even the food that we consume produces emissions and how we produce that food uh, creates emissions. And, um, and of course, even industry, think of all the smokestacks on those factories that are churning out emissions to produce all the stuff that we consume on a day-to-day basis that typically gets thrown away uh, and never used again, or gets used with limited lifetimes. So we need to really fundamentally think of an entire system of sources to shift to an economy built on life, built on circularity, built on uh, utilizing the resources that we already have in the system, and then using new materials that generate or regenerate to create that abundance. And that's how we can reduce the sources of emissions to zero. We need all of these solutions across all of these areas of human activity. And we, we, we evaluate uh, over 82, our research team, and I look at 82 solutions that cover all of these different um, areas of activity, all these different sectors. And, um, and so first of all, there are no top 10. This is not going to happen. There, there are some that are obviously more substantive, but if you look at the 25 or so of the most substantive solutions in terms of their climate impact, these cover food systems, agriculture, land use, um, uh, uh, electricity production, buildings, transportation, all of those sectors are represented in those 25. So we need all these sectors to be addressed. So, as Chad has emphasized, we need examples like Volvo cars and Mad Jeans in the respective sectors, but we also need innovation and collaboration across food, agriculture, energy, fast-moving consumer goods, electronics, and much more. We need to redesign the whole system with a different set of principles where waste no longer exists, we generate value in new ways, and we rebuild nature. Drawdown shows us that this is possible and we can positively, positively impact and regenerate our environment, not just do less bad. Thank you for watching and we hope you have really enjoyed this video. There is a longer version available of this conversation that you can find on the description of this video. And if you would like to see more, please subscribe to our YouTube channel or follow us on LinkedIn, Facebook and Twitter to be notified every time we go live. Thank you again and we look forward to seeing you in our upcoming episodes of the Circular Economy Show.